So we're back to Dogen again uh, and Genjo Koan. Uh, some of you have missed the beginning talks. If you're really interested in them, you could find them online on our website and listen to them there, just by a way of short introduction for those who haven't been here for those talks. Uh, Dogen is a 13th century monk who's a kind of big deal. Uh, he's uh, considered the, the uh, major figure in the Soto school, of which we are a part. And uh, he wrote a number of different uh, pieces, which were put together in a book called The Treasury of the True Dharma Eye. And uh, this Genjo Kowan is one of those uh, chapters of that book. Uh, so loosely translated, Genjo Kowan means the Kowan of everyday life or the koan of this very world, something like that. So we're kind of far along in it now, so we, there's a lot to read uh, of the lines that we've covered so far before we get to the lines for today. Although it's a lot to read and it's hard when you're just hearing it and there's no visual to take it in. Um, Try use it as a as an exercise to maintain your your attention when you find you've gone off and started thinking about lunch or something. Bring it back and listen to the words. Uh, there's something about repetition of hearing it week after week after week uh, when you sort of take it in with no effort. So um, here here goes again, Joe Cohen. You can find this online if you would like to read it on your own. When all dharmas are Buddha dharmas, there are delusion and realization practice, birth and death, Buddhas and living beings. And when the 10,000 dharmas are without self, there are no delusion, no realization, no Buddhas, no living beings, and no death. The Buddha way transcends being and non-being. Therefore, there are birth and death, delusion and enlightenment, living beings and Buddhas. Nevertheless, flowers fall, though we love them. Weeds grow, though we hate them. To carry the self forward and illuminate the 10,000 things is delusion. When the myriad things come forth and enlighten the self, this is awakening. Those who have great realization of delusion are Buddhas. Those who are greatly deluded about realization are sentient beings. Further, there are those who continue realizing beyond realization and those who are deluded throughout delusion. When Buddhas are truly Buddhas, they do not necessarily notice that they are Buddhas. However, they are actualized Buddhas, and they go on realizing Buddha. When you see forms or hear sounds with the whole body and mind, even though we are experiencing them directly, it is not like a mirror's reflection, not like the water and the moon. Now, in today's line, you're going to hear Dogen say that it's exactly like the water and the moon. So that's Dogen. He <laughs> contradicts himself. He is large. He contains multitudes. <laughs> While we are experiencing one side, we are blind to the other side. To study the Buddha way is to study the self. To study the self is to forget the self. To forget the self is to be awakened by the 10,000 things. When actualized by the myriad things, your body and mind, as well as the body and minds, oh, I think I left off a couple of, of others. I'm not sure what the rest of that line is. I, it went off the bottom of the page somehow. When you ride in a boat and watch the shore, you might assume that the shore is moving. But when you keep your eyes closely on the boat, you can see that it is the boat that moves. Similarly, if you examine the myriad things with a confused body and mind, you may suppose that you have a mind and essence that are permanent. 
When you practice intimately and return to where you are, it will be clear that nothing at all has an unchanging self. Firewood becomes ash and does not become firewood again. Yet we do not suppose that the ash is after and the firewood before. Actually, this is pretty much what we do suppose. <laughs> Understand that firewood abides in the condition of firewood, or you could also say firewood abides in the form of firewood, which fully includes before and after. While it is independent of before and after, ash abides in the form of ash, which fully includes before and after. Just as firewood does not become firewood again after it is ash, you do not return to birth after death. You now remember a few paragraphs back, he just said there was no death. This being so, it is the established teaching in Buddha Dharma to deny that birth turns into death. Accordingly, birth is understood as beyond birth. It is un an unshakable teaching that death does not turn into life. Accordingly, death is understood as beyond death. Birth is a form complete in the moment. Death is a form complete in the moment. They are like winter and spring. You do not say that winter becomes spring or that spring becomes summer. So those were the last lines we talked about. Now here are today's lines. Dogen says, enlightenment is like the moon reflected on the water. The moon does not get wet, nor is the water broken. Although its light is wide and great, the moon is reflected even in a puddle an inch wide. The whole moon and the entire sky are reflected in dewdrops on the grass or even in one drop of water. Enlightenment does not divide you, just as the moon does not break the water. You cannot hinder enlightenment, just as a drop of water does not crush the moon in the sky. The depth of the drop is the height of the moon. Each reflection, however long or short its duration, manifests the vastness of the dewdrop and realizes the limitlessness of the moon in the sky. So there's Dogen giving us a, a metaphor, actually a simile. Enlightenment is like the moon reflected on the water, he says. So he's beginning here with a comparison. And the, the question immediately occurs to the alert reader, how is enlightenment like the moon reflected in the water? In what way are they alike? So as you'll remember, this line is a contradiction to the line he wrote earlier when he says uh, that it is not like a mirror's reflection, not like water and the moon. So in, the, in, these, in these lines that I just talked about, he's taking a dualistic view, an everyday life kind of view. So when you're looking at things from the point of view of form, then you don't see objects as empty. And when you're looking at emptiness, you don't see form. This is why he says that when you see one side, the other side is obscured. And when you see the other side, then the previous side is obscured. So Dogen is reversing himself now in these current lines. In Enlightenment, he says, you see both points of view at once, the absolute and the relative. The dark side and the light side are both included. These two ways of viewing things are intimate, and, and Dogen uses the word, they do not hinder each other. You no longer only see one side at a time. 
he points out that water contains the moon and the moon contains the water. Sometimes when Buddhists speak of enlightenment, they are pointing out that when you finally break through from delusion and see the emptiness of things, they're, they're calling this enlightenment. So sometimes enlightenment is spoken of as though it were only seeing the absolute, only seeing emptiness. But Dogen does not see enlightenment like this for the most part. He sees it as containing both the relative and the absolute points of view. Sometimes he takes one side, sometimes he takes the other side, sometimes he takes the side that they're both the same. In the, in the uh, identity of the relative and absolute, which is a sutra that we chant during session, there are these lines. It says, to encounter the absolute is not yet enlightenment. To be attached to things is delusion. What that sutra is saying is that to look at things as permanent forms is illusion or delusion. To look at things as empty only, this is also a kind of delusion. This is not yet enlightenment. In order to be enlightened, you have to see both sides. So what Dogen is emphasizing here and what the identity of relative and absolute is emphasizing is something called, he calls, non-hindrance. It does not hinder. Non-hindrance in Buddhism is a term used to indicate that form and emptiness uh, do, not, uh, do not hinder each other, that they're the same. If there is water and the moon is out, then naturally the moon will be reflected in that water. It will be reflected easily, no problem, no hindrance. So what this means is that, that although things have form, all forms are empty. Both form and emptiness exist together without any interference, one with the other, no distortion as the uh, sutra that we chant says, they work together like two arrows meeting in midair. They work together like a box and its lid. Even though in one way of looking at it there are two different sides, each side contains the other side. So what Dogen is really describing here is Indra's net. This is the the metaphor that Buddhists use to describe the universe. It's a vast net where all strands of the net cross is a jewel. There are millions and millions of jewels in this net. Everything in the universe is in this net. And each thing reflects every other thing. Each jewel is reflecting every other jewel. So they're all in this net together. So in that sense, they're all one. But each is individual as well. In his second line here, Dogen says, the moon does not get wet, nor the water broken. So this line is basically Expanding on the point he made in the first line, it emphasizes that though the moon is one with the water, it retains its own form and character. It does not, quote, get wet. The water also retains its own form and character. It is not, quote, broken. What Dogen is basically saying is that there is no way the moon disturbs the water since they are one. The 10,000 things are both one and individual at the same time. Both one and individual. 
you are both one with all things and also an individual. So what he's saying here is what the Heart Sutra says. We'll be chanting it in a little while. Form and emptiness are like a pair, like the foot before and the foot behind in walking. Each thing has its own intrinsic value, that's the individual, and is related to everything else in function and position. That's the oneness. So the next two lines, Dogen says, although its light is wide and great, the moon is reflected even in a puddle an inch wide. The whole moon and the entire sky are reflected in dewdrops on the grass or even in one drop of water. So we know, according to the net of Indra, according to the Buddhist way of seeing things, that each thing always contains every other thing. All objects contain all other objects, regardless of their size, regardless of their position in time or place. That is how even in a puddle of one inch, the wide and great moon can be reflected. There is no way to measure time, size, or location. This very moment contains all of the past and the future, and all points in space and time. Regardless of whether a moment is short or long, it contains everything. This is the Buddhist point of view. In terms of living out our lives in the Dharma, the implications of this view are very wide. It means that enlightenment pervades even the most limited person. We are all Buddha. Some of us are big Buddhas, some of us are small Buddhas. But Buddha nature is the same in each, whether it's big or small. We know that Buddha said the first thing he said upon his own enlightenment was, all sentient beings and I are intrinsically Buddha. The sh this is a Zen saying, the short bamboo is short, the long bamboo is long. It's just how it is. Some of us are big Buddhas, some of us are small Buddhas but we're all Buddhas. And Buddha nature never changes in its completeness. Buddha nature is just as complete in someone who never practices as it is with the most assiduous practitioner. Those of you who have heard previous talks will remember Dogen's view of time. On the one hand, he teaches that there is only one time that we can experience. And that is the here and now, this very moment. The now is very restricted in a way. It's this flesh. But it's also completely unrestricted. It contains everything. So how does it do that, you might ask? It contains everything because of karma, because of cause and effect. If everything is the result of a cause, and every effect becomes the cause of what comes next, then everything that exists contains the results of what has passed. And it also contains the, se the seeds of what is to come. You get that? If everything is caused, then each effect is the way it is because of the causes of the past. And each future moment, event, person, time, will be the result of this, this current moment, which also contains the past. So the best example of this process is you yourself. You can only be aware of what you're experiencing in each moment. 
but the you of this moment contains your whole history, your whole experience. And the way you are now contains the seeds of your future. Now, if you're not liking the way you are now, this may sound like a very hopeless kind of prediction. But remember, in each moment, we have the choice to change the next moment. So we can change uh, our, we can make a new cause and effect. Enlightenment always takes the shape of the person. The person is always the embodiment of enlightenment. You know, I often tell people that I'm exactly the same as I was the first day I sat on a Zafu. And yet, I'm completely different. So I'm still Pat, same old crazy person. But uh, also, I mean, my life has changed tremendously. So it's a, it's a paradox. Since the moon, that is enlightenment, pervades the water, that is the person, you, it extends to everything the person does or says, however tiny. Dogen points to the truth that even the most insignificant thing the most insignificant form is Buddha. The smallest act that you do is full of import because it's going to influence everything else and it's going to become a, a cause and an effect. If, according to the Net of Indra, everything reflects everything else, then every act reverberates throughout the whole universe. So it matters what we do. Even the smallest act counts. It's a big responsibility to live your life this way. My first teacher used to attack beat Zen a lot. Uh, and he used to say that their philosophy was, I don't know, I don't care, and it doesn't matter anyway. He had that wrong, I have to say. I'm not sure he ever read Jack Kerouac, but uh, <laughs> there's a little more there than that. But he used to say, uh, I know, I care deeply, and it matters immensely. This is Zen Buddhism, not beat Zen. Uh, one of the commentators that I consulted on this talk was uh, Nishihara, and he says in his commentary uh, at, at this point, he says, one phrase is the result of a lifetime. So everything you say comes out of your whole history, your whole life. One action is the accumulation of the power of your entire practice. So that's pretty powerful. One phrase is the result of a lifetime. One action is the accumulation of the power of your entire practice. You may just shut up and never say anything again, right? <laughs> when the Dharma is expressed in a finger snap, it's a small gesture, but it expresses enlightenment. When the Dharma is shown as the largest mountain in all its greatness, it also expresses enlightenment, big or small, fully enlightenment expression. In enlightenment, there is no problem of big and small, important or unimportant. Each moment is fully important and expresses the Dharma fully and completely. You know, I sometimes say this when I see people like spacing out when they're thinning, they're holding their sutra book waiting for service to start or something of the sort. You know, there's no waiting in Zen. You don't just throw that time away and say, well, I'm waiting, I, you know. No, you should be completely present, completely focused. That moment is important as any other moment. You know, if we live that way, then we have this big event planned that's coming up. We've been planning it for months. It's very important. You know, we're getting married, we're having a baby, whatever, something big, you know. And then we're not present for that either. We just throw it away. 
So it's important to practice in what we would call, in our blindness, small moments. Dogen continues, enlightenment does not divide you just as the moon does not break the water. Again, Dogen is continuing the comparison of the original simile. He's stressing this non-hindrance. Moon and water are one. So since you and enlightenment are one, you coexist with, with enlightenment just as you are. You're unbroken by it. Just as the moon and water are one, but each retains its own form and character, the same is true of be beings and enlightenment. Enlightenment leaves no trace. It does not divide you. You remain yourself. This is why I can say I'm exactly the same person I was when I started. Enlightenment does not change from person to person. It's not broken or changed by you or anyone else. The moon does not get wet. You may want a special enlightenment that solves your problems, but you will still be you with all your habits, likes, dislikes. You'll still suffer. Bad things will happen to you. Enlightenment does not destroy your mind, your personality, nor does it help your mind, your personality. And your mind does not hinder enlightenment. This reminds me of a saying that maturity is realizing that sooner or later everything that happens to everybody else will happen to you. As I look back on my life as an older person, and realize well, how I thought it was going to go when I was young. No way. Dogen continues, the depth of the drop is the height of the moon. Each reflection, however long or short its duration, manifests the vastness of the dewdrop and realizes the limitlessness of the moonlight in the sky. Remember, the water is, is the being, and the moonlight is enlightenment. So the water image, the dewdrop, is the image that stands in for beings. The water is you. What he's saying about this experience of beings reflecting enlightenment is, again, that enlightenment doesn't change us. It doesn't disturb us. It doesn't change who we are. What we see in realization is always the same truth. What you see and what I see in our zazen, it's the same. You often think that somebody else is having some very calm, fabulous experience sitting there on the cushion. But the same thing that's going on in your mind is going on in their mind. Not the exact same thoughts, but thoughts. The content is slightly different, but the avalanche of thoughts is the same. Realization is big, yet it can be realized by any human. This is what Dogen is saying. However cramped or small that person's spirit or understanding are, they can see enlightenment. They are enlightenment. This is what Dogen is pointing to when he says the depth of the drop is the height of the moon. If it's a small container, maybe the realization is smallish. If it's a big container, the realization may be bigger. But it's the same realization. And there are realized Buddhas and unrealized Buddhas. So everyone is a Buddha. Some people realize it and live a Buddha life, and some people don't. But they're still a Buddha. Does a dog have Buddha nature? Yes. Although the Cohen says no. <laughs> Since essentially, if we ask what enlightenment is, it's the inescapable truth about the way the world works. That's just what enlightenment is. It just, it's the truth about how things are. So Dogen is saying that every being is subject to the rules of karma to the way the world works. 
Everyone is living out their joys and sorrows, their strengths and their weaknesses, and each being embodies the truth of the whole universe. So Dogen tells us that just as we are, just as our life is, we embody Buddha nature, we embody the truth. We do not have to change, and indeed enlightenment does not change us. We generally try for enlightenment because we want to change. We want to see some improvement in our lives. And you know, the kind of things that improve in your life are sort of byproducts. So this is an important point that Dogen is making. The point is that though you do not change much in enlightenment, you see that unchanged self very differently, and that's important. You still have most of the faults that you wanted to get rid of. Some of them aren't even faults, you just thought they were. But you accept yourself the way you are. You aren't worried about being flawed. In fact, you don't even see yourself as flawed anymore. You're perfect just the way you are. You see yourself in your life in a new context, in a Dharma context. Basically, the context in which you see yourself is the net of Indra. This is a large and a deep view. You can pull back a few million miles from yourself and look at yourself struggling down here on Earth with all the other little beings. And it looks very different than when you're like inside your turmoil. This Dharma view provides a context in which you can see your oneness with the whole universe, a context in which you can see that everything you do is exquisitely important because it's affecting everything else. And that makes a big difference. I was consulting uh, uh, something I found online by um, Norman Fisher, a teacher that I like. And uh, this is what he says about this particular point in Genjo Cohen. He says, instead of thinking, oh, this pathetic little life and it's almost over, <laughs> you think, what a magnificent journey. Everything that ever could happen has happened perfectly. So should, we should all memorize that. <laughs> so uh, here's a, I have to read you another line here if I can find it. It's on page seven, four, three, six, seven. Okay, here's the line I wanted to read you. This is the second line of this section. He says, each reflection, however long or short, its duration, manifests the vastness of the dewdrop and realizes the limitlessness of the moonlight in the sky. So Dogen is talking about this. He says, the whole moon and the entire sky are reflected in dewdrops on the grass, or even in one little dewdrop. Each reflection manifests the vastness of the dewdrops, he says, and realizes the limitlessness of the moonlight in the sky. Even though the form of the dewdrop is tiny, it's vast because it's empty and because it contains everything else. Big or small, what we do matters. It reverberates throughout the universe. When we compare things, we make judgments about big and small, hard and easy, right and wrong. But when there is only one moment at a time, there's nothing to compare to that. Things are just as they are. So when we start comparing, this is when suffering enters our life. Rather than live each moment as it is, without judgment, we compare it to some other moment that we think would be better or worse. We compare who we are 
to that better, more successful, more beautiful, smarter person that we wish we were. And we are dissatisfied. This blinds us to the truth of each perfect moment. This perfect us exists right here, right now. At every moment, the entire truth of the universe is embodied in us. You and enlightenment do not divide or hinder each other. You will always reflect the whole Dharma just by being you. Sounds like Mr. Rogers. <laughs> you can't fall out of the truth of the way that the world works. There's no way to leave Dharma, to leave Buddha nature, to leave truth. No matter how ineffectual a practitioner you are, or even if you don't practice at all, even when you can't see the truth, you, you are still it. What does this mean for our lives? What difference does it make to the way we live? When we see the truth, our response is to start paying close attention. We pay close attention to this life we're living. We stop being careless. We start living a thoughtless, stop living a thoughtless life. Because we see everything we do as a reflection of universal truth. In each moment, your whole life and your whole practice is reflected. In what you would call a meaningful moment, it is reflected. In what you would call an unimportant moment, it is reflected. We can see the whole you in each tiny act. This is why it's crazy to try to dissemble. You know, we try to put on a face and want people to think we are how we present ourselves. But you know, who you are speaks loudly and everyone sees it. It's not too hard to see through people. We can see you. So give it up. Nothing wrong with you anyway. So think about all this and it may cause you to proceed carefully in your life, but freely. This is the whole thing about the precepts, you know, when we have our precepts ceremony. They should slow you down and cause you to proceed carefully, thoughtfully, and yet they offer a huge freedom and how to, how to live your life. I've got a whole little bird's nest down here. So next time, in a couple of weeks, more Dogen. <laughs>